Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the International Lawyers Network's webinar presentation, Development Strategies for Associates. I'll be introducing David Ackert in just a moment, but in this presentation, David provides an overview of techniques from the Practice Boomers e-learning program, specifically geared towards burgeoning business getters. That includes learning how to target and nurture the contacts who will develop into significant prospects, discovering time management techniques that allow you to manage existing commitments and new pursuits, and finding out how to leverage mentors for opportunities that accelerate career advancement. At the conclusion of the program, there will be a brief walkthrough of the award-winning Practice Boomers e-learning platform. Our presenter today is David Ackert, who's been a business development advisor to law firms since the late 90s. He's developed and implemented business development programs for some of the top firms on the AMLA 100. He's the president of the Ackert Advisory, which provides business development coaching and training for service firms and their professionals. He's also the founder of Practice Boomers, a business development e-learning program and winner of two Your Honor Awards for Excellence in Practice Development. So with that, I will pass it over to David. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Uh, so I want to go through our agenda today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about why business development at the associate level is so critical, especially in our current marketplace. Uh, talk about your leverage points, which I'll define in more detail later, but the idea there is really playing to your strengths. Uh, and then we'll get into some of the networking strategies that uh, Lindsay talked about a moment ago. We are going to spend some time on this idea of mentorship and how it can advance your business development uh, endeavors. And finally, talk about uh, establishing credibility within a market niche, which is one of the key ways that an associate can start to differentiate themselves as they are uh, going about their practice development. Uh, at the end of the program, I'll, I'll say a few words about where these materials came from, the program that we have called Practice Boomers, which we use to train mostly associate or junior partner level lawyers inside of law firms across the globe. So getting a head start, all of the techniques that I'm going to share with you are really designed to be as efficient as possible. Lawyers really don't have a lot of time at any level, whether it's associate or partner or what have you to uh, do the kind of business development exploration that one might have in a more ideal setting where you can really try the trial by error. Well, I tried this, it didn't work so well for me. I tried that, it didn't work so well for me. We really have to get there pretty quickly for a number of reasons. The marketplace has shifted. There used to be a time not so long ago when your business development strategy was just answering the phone, either because the partners were kicking down work or uh, you found once you made partner that the work was just coming to you. People would call the firm and, and the work would get funneled over to you. So uh, those days have changed. The landscape, as we all know, has gotten a lot more competitive. Uh, there are more lawyers out there than ever, and there's uh, other services competing for the kind of legal services uh, that your firm uh, might have once handled but now is, fi is finding to be commoditized uh, either by competitors or uh, being brought in-house uh, more than, uh, than, than had been in the past. So lawyers are really finding themselves in this role where they have to learn uh, a skill set called business development, or to put it crudely, how to sell yourself into the marketplace. And this is a very uncomfortable notion for most lawyers. Now, this new generation of associates uh, tends to be much more entrepreneurial, I'm finding, and that's good news. Um, because it's necessary to have that mindset in order to pursue the business. But pursuing the business is no longer a luxury, it's a necessity. And as you know, uh, one's influence at a law firm is largely predicated on the book of business that they have and the degree to which they're able to contribute financially to the firm. So it's important to get a head start on business development because it's not an overnight endeavor. The relationships that you have now uh, or that you make now won't translate into business for years to come in most cases. You know, you have lunch with a potential referral source or a prospective client, and, uh, you know, that's all well and good, but it may be years until they have a matter for you. And that's only if you nurture the relationship. They're not going to remember you from four years ago just because you had a sandwich together that one time. So it's uh, – it's really critical to get a jump start on this 
because there is such a long lead time before the business development effort turns into uh, a result. And so we want to look at the techniques that are going to be a good use of your time so you can find that shortest distance between where you are and where you want to be. And you also want to uh, begin the process as early as possible so that you can plant those seeds that will ultimately germinate into the result that you're looking for. So one of the ways to do that, one of the ways to be as efficient with business development as possible is to find your leverage point. Now, what I mean by that is that everyone has a different personality, a different practice group, a different network, uh, a different series of business opportunities before them. So it's impossible to say to every lawyer, we'll just do this one thing and it'll work. Uh, so you have to design uh, a strategy around your strengths. Now, some of you are more introverted and you would rather be in a one-on-one -on -one setting than in a big room full of people where you have to network with everyone in the room. Some of you are much more comfortable speaking on a panel than getting yourself to sit down and write an article. Some of you are the other way around. You'd much rather, you know, put, put yourself in a room in front of a computer screen and, uh, and write a really good article as opposed to having to socialize and, and network. So everyone's a little bit different, and some of this has to do with your own personality. Some of it also has to do with your practice area and the kind of network that you have. But you want to recognize that regardless of what your leverage point might be, you can build a business development strategy around it. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, you know what, I'm much more comfortable blogging than doing anything else. That's fine. Start blogging now. Start to develop an audience around your blog. Uh, start to develop dialogues with people around your blog where instead of just opining on a particular law or topic, you're actually interviewing people, taking sort of a journalistic approach where you're getting quotes from people for your blog. That is a kind of relationship development technique that can, you, that can be an excellent way of taking your leverage point and turning it into a business development endeavor. So these are, just an, these are just examples of some of the leverage points that we have seen affect, be effective for lawyers over the years. Uh, and you, you may want to just take a moment and write down the ones that really resonate for you. Are you more effective at a group setting? Are you one of those people who's very good at introducing this person to that person and really kind of being the life of the party? Or are you more effective in a one-on-one -on -one meeting where it's just you and one other person and some quality time where you can really go deep with them? Are you more comfortable public speaking, being on a panel, or delivering some sort of CLE presentation? Or would you be more comfortable perhaps uh, teaching uh, or mentoring other people? So it's a, a kind of public speaking where you are advising others, but essentially it's a more intimate setting. Some of you would rather be writing Others would like to translate that writing into social media so you have a, a broad platform. Uh, many, many lawyers use LinkedIn aggressively as a way to develop business, and it can be done very effectively. Uh, so if that's your leverage point, if you just find that you're attracted to social media, there's no reason why you can't develop a, a business development technique around it. Perhaps for you, you really enjoy being on committees, whether those are charity boards or roundtable settings where there are various discussions at the table. Uh, some of you would thrive in a networking group or a bar association group. Others would prefer to actually facilitate the meetings at those groups rather than just attend them. So you get the sense here, um, just to go down the list and, and write down whichever ones really resonate for you, because that will end up being the doorway through which you, uh, you place a lot of your business development energy. And I would say don't try to do all of these. In fact, I would limit myself to just two or maybe even three that have the highest likelihood uh, to be sustainable. You see, part of the challenge that I think a lot of associates uh, encounter is that they're getting advice from a lot of different places. The senior partners at the firm are saying, well, in my day, you know, I got out there and I shook a lot of hands and then I eventually developed a client base. Well, that's all well and good for them, but things are different now, and maybe the associate isn't someone who's very comfortable shaking hands. 
maybe the associate would rather, uh, you know, be doing social media and, and, and writing blogs. There's nothing wrong with that, and you can build a practice off of that. But you want to know now what it is that's going to work for you so that you can focus on that and so that it can be sustainable. Because if you don't like getting out there and doing a lot of schmoozing and networking with big groups of people, even if the firm forces you to do it, you aren't going to sustain it. You'll always have some excuse that keeps you from doing it, uh, whether that's a relevant excuse or a, a – uh, yeah, a relevant excuse like, you know, client matters, <laughs> or it's just you didn't feel like it, you didn't have the energy for it, and and uh, and so on. So it has to be sustainable, and it's only going to be sustainable if it is aligned with your personality and your proclivities. Let's move into the next topic, talk a little bit more about networking. So whether you're networking in a one-on-one -on -one setting or networking through various groups that you may belong to or a charity board, it doesn't matter. It's all involvement with other people. It's contact with other people. And this is critical. You do have to find a way to this because ultimately you can't have a book of business unless other people are involved. I mean, a book of business is, by definition, uh, your servicing of other people's needs. And so other people fall into this uh, equation. Um, your existing network is going to be one of the most powerful resources that you have in the years to come. So you want to make sure that you have some sort of CRM, customer relationship management or client relationship management tool uh, in place. Now, some of you are just using Outlook for this, and that's okay, but Outlook has some limitations around its ability to really keep your relationships top of mind. Um, so uh, there are other CRM platforms out there that you may want to consider. Your firm may already have invested in some of them. Uh, you may find that you're not all that interested in the CRM that your firm has invested in, so there are other al alternatives that you can explore as well. The marketplace is full of uh, technologies that can support you in this, but ultimately you want to make sure that you have that short list of whatever it is, 20, 30 people Maybe they're um, fellow alumni from your law school. Maybe it's that cousin of yours who is a serial entrepreneur and always, you know, talking about uh, opening the next company or that next idea that's going to take over the marketplace. That's a good person to just stay in front of and make sure that they know what you do and make sure that uh, you are offering as much uh, help to them as possible so that they really start to see you as a trusted resource and advisor. Even though you're an associate right now and you may not have all of the competence that you'll have in the years to come, uh, if your intention to help them is clear and your interest in what they're doing is developed at an early stage, that will send a very clear message to them in terms of uh, who they should be calling when a legal issue comes up for them. Also, routines are really critical. You know, if we just wait until we feel like reaching out to somebody or, you know, they reach out to us as being our trigger, for networking, we may be waiting a long time. And ultimately, we have to remember that, uh, you know, you as the business developer, you are the person who has the real incentive. You are the person who will benefit from reaching out from a business perspective, not necessarily a social one, but you're, you're the one who stands to gain the most out of staying in contact with people who will have a business opportunity for you down the road. So um, establish some sort of routine. It might be something like, you know, once a quarter, I reach out to these 20 people, or once a, every five months, or whatever's right for you, it's fine. Just make sure that you've got that routine in place. Again, this is why technology is so helpful, because if you have some sort of uh, system that reminds you every three months, four months, five months, oh, don't forget to call Mary, don't forget to call Joe, don't forget to call Sue, then you will find yourself much more likely to stay on their radar, as opposed to relying on your memory which may or may not remind you as consistently as you would like. At this stage of your career, you're going to find that you are taken most seriously by your peers, not so much by people who are 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, whatever it is, your senior. So uh, recognizing this, whenever you are in a setting where there is someone who is in the same demographic as you. By demographic, I'm really talking about age as much as anything else. But, you know, if you are at a client site and you spot someone else who's roughly your age and maybe they're working uh, on, the, uh, on the inside the legal department, that's a good person for you to reach out to. You're going to find that you immediately have things in common. You have 
uh, a, a, an, a, an easier time relating to them than you will if you're trying to develop a relationship with the general counsel who's 53 years old. So um, the, that demographic piece is really critical. If you're in any kind of an environment, any kind of room where you're looking at where should I be developing business, seek out the people who are close to you in age. Um, because even if you manage to you know, make friends with, you know, the CEO of some organization at a networking event or a fundraiser or whatever it is, the CEO probably isn't going to send you some significant matter anytime soon. Now, we're going to talk about a strategy in a moment that uh, can perhaps um, help with that. But generally speaking, you want to seek out the people who are similar to you in terms of their circumstances because as they develop, and you put them on that short list and you stay on their radar, you'll find that they are a, a much better investment of your time. And again, what we're talking about here are time efficient strategies that will lead to a result as quickly as possible for you. A lot of lawyers prefer to network with other lawyers and I can certainly understand why that's the case. You immediately have something to talk about, you share a common interest, perhaps even a common passion, you certainly share a profession. But lawyers are not always going to be the best source for business. Now, oftentimes they are, depends on the firm where you are. If you're a full service firm, then it might be difficult for you to network with other lawyers because the truth is any business uh, that you have for another lawyer, you're going to want to give to another lawyer at your firm rather than a lawyer who's not at your firm. But uh, for those of you who are at smaller firms, perhaps you can find these alliances where there's more cross-referral business or conflict work uh, that comes from a lawyer outside your firm. But don't just think in terms of lawyers because ultimately the most you can hope for is that a lawyer is going to be a referral source. I mean, unless you're in you know, professional liability or something like that, most of the time lawyers are not going to engage you for a legal matter, but non-lawyers will. That's why non-lawyers seek out lawyers. They have a legal matter, they need help. So make sure that your network includes other kinds of advisors, business owners, uh, people who are stakeholders in the business community. Uh, because ultimately, those are going to be, be the people who hear about someone who's having legal trouble and who need to either engage you directly or to refer that matter to you. And they can't themselves take care of it because they're not a lawyer. So as you're looking at that short list of 20 people that you're creating for yourself, those people that you're going to stay in touch with on a, on a regular basis and have some sort of routine with, make sure that's not a list of 20 lawyers. Uh, because you want a little bit of variety there. You want your network be uh, a dynamic pipeline for a variety of opportunities. One of the easiest and uh, most time efficient ways to develop relationships is around social activities. So um, I can give, give you a couple of examples. I have a, uh, a group of uh, friends who get together uh, about once a month, we have dinner together, we talk about, you know, various issues, some of them personal, some of them business related, but it's basically a, a round table of business owners, of, of CEOs or presidents of businesses that are growing quickly and we share different uh, ideas and we have a couple of lawyers at that table too and those lawyers give us business advice or, uh, you know, just share some of the struggles that they're having with their own practice. This is a, a really excellent opportunity for those lawyers because obviously whenever I have a legal matter, or any kind of business challenge, they're hearing about it first. And they can say, you know what, David, why don't you call me tomorrow? Let me see if maybe we can, you know, help you with that in a more formal way. But that all comes out of this dinner that we have together that's a lot of fun. And, you know, I would go regardless of whether or not I had any sort of you know, legal issue. I just go because I, I'm, I've developed a friendship with these people and it's become part of my social uh, sort of pattern, if you will. So whatever it is for you, it might be a wine club, it might be a cigar club, it might be poker, it might be uh, watching the game together, it might be, uh, you know, uh, a book club. Again, you can match these activities to whatever it is that you happen to have a passion for so that it's something that you're going to want to stay engaged in over time. And then you can get really strategic about who you invite to the table. Again, this is why it's a good idea to invite people in your demographic because if one of the things that you really love to do is watch the game together, well then get a couple of other people who also have a passion for that same sport 
and be strategic about who they are. Make sure that they're business leaders or people who are inside of legal departments or uh, people who uh, perhaps are uh, entrepreneurs or investors in some way and are likely to bring legal matters to you. Or perhaps they are lawyers in non-competing environments where they might be able to refer something to you. And in this way, you'll have a very regular way of staying in touch with them that doesn't feel so much like networking or schmoozing or business development. You're just getting together with friends doing something that you do on a regular basis. Okay. Let's uh, change topics over to the subject of mentor. And uh, by the way, if um, I don't think Lindsay or I mentioned this earlier, but if any of you have questions as we go through this program, I am going to um, have a section at the end here. I've reserved a few minutes for Q&A. We'd be happy to hear from you if you have questions that are specific to your firm or your practice or uh, anything that you might be, um, you might be dealing with. And uh, I do encourage you during that time to ask questions because I've prepared some comments here. These are obviously strategies that I've found to be most effective at the associate level, and I'll be sharing them with you, but um, I can't know what your unique situation or circumstances or challenges might be. And so if you use that uh, section at the end and uh, share some of those comments or questions, then I can tailor what I have to say to your specific need. Internal mentors are certainly very common at firms. Most firms have some sort of internal mentorship program, not necessarily an internal business development mentor, although I do recommend if your firm doesn't have that, that you seek one out. So that would be perhaps if you're an associate, it might be a, a mid-level partner who uh, has really done well in terms of developing a book of business, uh, someone who you still can kind of relate to. They're not so much older than you that their advice might start to seem a little bit irrelevant. Uh, it's someone who you respect, someone who uh, you aspire uh, to be in some way. And an, in an internal business, business development mentor will uh, often be most effective if their approach is compatible with your leverage points. So if you've determined that, you know, charity boards are really the way to go for you, then seek out a business development mentor who has also found that, found some success through that approach. This internal business development mentor will provide advice and encouragement. Obviously, they understand the politics and the culture of your firm, so uh, they'll be able to speak to those issues and help you navigate that terrain. They may introduce potential allies to your practice, like a referral source or someone who uh, they're not currently utilizing as a resource, and uh, they might uh, make sure that you have that resource since you are, uh, you are working with them in a mentor-mentee relationship. But the one challenge here to an internal business development mentor is that they won't introduce you to prospective clients. Of course not. They've got their own book of business to build. Unless it's a really small matter or they're going to have you work on it, but they're going to be the relationship partner, in which case it's not your book of business anyway. So uh, this is the limitation to an internal business development mentor. They will provide advice, which is great, but they will not provide introductions to clients. So what you may want to think about is additionally fostering an external business development mentor relationship. So an external business development mentor, external to your firm, is someone who is willing to shepherd a smart, ambitious professional, right, that being you, preferably a business leader in your warm market. So warm market being someone where you already have some sort of connection to them. It's not a completely cold, distant connection, but maybe it's a friend of a friend. Maybe it's your second cousin's uncle. Maybe it's uh, the father of a uh, law school uh, alumni uh, or mother uh, who is a business leader in some way. It can be a family friend, former employer even. And what you want to do is follow the steps that I'm about to take you through in order to broach the topic of having them become your business development mentor. Now, some of you may be thinking, why on earth would a CEO of a company or a, uh, uh, a business leader of some sort want to have a lawyer as their mentee and to mentor them? 
Well, we're about to answer that question, and I think it will be uh, a worthwhile suit for you because all of a sudden you'll find yourself connected to someone who not only can provide advice, not only has business acumen and can help you develop the business that you're looking to develop. Obviously, they know a thing or two about developing business, or they wouldn't be a business leader. They wouldn't have a business. Um, but also, it's someone who can either become a client in the years to come or can refer prospective clients to you. So they don't have that limitation that an internal business development mentor has. So here are the steps. The first one is to identify. How do you identify an external business development mentor? Well, they need, to be in a, they need to be in a position where they could help you, right? So they have some sort of elevated status. They're a businessman or businesswoman uh, inside of uh, an organization where they can actually help you. Now, it's unlikely that they will be inside a legal department because that suddenly feels a little too much like a client development relationship. So they might be adjacent to legal. Uh, they might be in finance. They might be part of uh, the marketing or uh, sales uh, uh, leadership team. Uh, they might be um, a, a business owner of a mid-sized business and they have the CEO role. But it's someone who's ultimately in a position where they are, uh, they're able to help you. They share some sort of commonality with you. Maybe you have a friend in common. Maybe you're from the same hometown. Maybe you just share some interests. Uh, and obviously they need to be older than you because it's rather strange to be mentored by someone who is your age, even if there's someone who is more successful than you are from a business perspective. So as you are thinking about people in your network who fit this characteristic from an external mentor perspective, uh, you know, consider these characteristics and consider whether or not there's someone that you might um, either have access to now or be able to ask a friend or a colleague to give you access to. Then there's the approach. Now, the approach is key because if you just come to someone and say, hey, I want you to be my external business development mentor, uh, they probably aren't going to know what you're talking about and they might feel like that's an awfully big commitment uh, for someone that they may not know very well. So the first thing to do is really to take them out for drinks or a cup of coffee or a dinner and just say, listen, I just want to um, get some advice from you. I mean, I'm a, an associate at a law firm, and I don't know how much you know about law firms, but in this day and age, associates really are expected to develop business for the organization. I didn't have any formal training when it comes to business development. I went to law school, not business school. Um, and so I would really appreciate learning from you how you've developed your business. How have you built this business from, you know, wherever it was to wherever it is now? So any business principles, any guidance that you might have, any resources that you can think of would be really helpful. Would you be open to just a half hour cup of coffee where we can discuss that? Now, most people will say yes to that as long as they have some sort of connection to you because, frankly, it's flattering. It's flattering for them to uh, be able to provide this kind of advice to someone who has recognized their accomplishments as having value. And 30 minutes is not a, a not, a not a lot to ask. Now, again, if this is a cold relationship, you've never met them before, you have no friends in common, you have no idea about them except you just, you know, read an article that they wrote or you, uh, you know, saw them on LinkedIn or something, it's probably not going to work. So you do want to make sure you have some sort of connection to them. They're a friend of a friend or they're the family member of a friend or uh, you happen to run into them at that fundraising event or whatever it is, something so that you can follow on to an existing thread of connection. So once you approach them and you uh, have that cup of coffee, you move into inquiring, which we've talked about. So those, for those of you who have the slides, you will, you'll see this. And, and the, the key piece here is at the end of that cup of coffee, you want to ask them, what would they do if they were in your shoes? So you've given them a sense of, you know, okay, these are the challenges that I have at my firm, and these are the challenges I have as a business developer, and here's where I see some of the principles that you've shared with me could be relevant. What would you do in my shoes? Now, that's a really interesting question because there's no wrong answer to that question. They could just say, well, I guess the first thing I would do is this or that, and they'll give you some advice which um, hopefully you will find helpful, but you want to really look to apply their advice as much as possible because that leads us to the fourth step. You follow up and maintain contact with them. So whatever advice they gave you, follow it. And 
report back to them that it was helpful. Tell them what you learned in your application of it. Or, you know, you can be honest about it. Look, I tried it. It kind of worked. This piece didn't work. I'm really eager to talk about that piece that didn't work and hear your insight on that. Because what's happened now is that this mentor is um, entering into a dynamic with you where they're invested in your success. They already spent a half hour with you. They gave you some of their advice. You took the trouble to follow it and to follow up with them, which speaks well of you. It shows them that you're a responsive professional. It shows them that you are taking them seriously. It shows them that, you know, you really are invested in a successful mentorship. All of those things are flattering to them. All of those things uh, keep them invested in the relationship. So when you share your successes, they will be more inclined to meet with you again. Well, sure, let's have another cup of coffee and we'll talk about how we can tweak this further. And now the ball is in your court. You want to be the person who's maintaining this. So every, you know, three, four months, five months, whatever, again, is right for you, you put them on that short list of 20 people and you sit down with them and you share with them whatever your challenges are and you seek out their advice. Now, this is one of – this notion of mentorship is one of the only ways I know – to bridge that demographic divide. Because unless they are mentoring you, unless they are emotionally invested in your success, you're going to find it very difficult for senior people in a business community to invest a lot of time in, a, in an associate who's at a junior level to them. So now that you have this mentorship, now that both of you are starting to develop this relationship around advice sharing, you're going to find over time that one of two things happen. Either they continuously give you advice and the advice is helpful and you apply it and you develop business acumen, which is invaluable, or you have that scenario plus they start to send you relationships that can engage you for work. And when a, when a business leader picks up the phone and says, hey, listen, um, there's this lawyer who I know, he's really an up, or he or she is an up and coming person in their law firm. And uh, I think that they could be a, a good resource to you. I think you should engage them uh, for your company or for your matter or what have you. That endorsement goes a long way toward an engagement. So, again, this mentor can very easily become someone who leads to work opportunities for you, but only if you invest in them first and only if you – uh, leverage the fact that you have this advice that you are looking for from them as an opportunity to develop a real authentic connection. So that's the key. And you'll find that these people are able to give you opportunities that some of your junior or mid-level partners don't even have access to. And again, it's only because this, this business leader, this mentor is looking out for you because you've bothered to invest in them. Make sure that they know that you'd like to meet them more regularly so that they can start to get used to the idea of hearing from you on a regular basis and you build the relationship from there. So those are the four steps of developing an external business development mentor. I've seen this strategy work very well for associates and, and it really does provide a shortcut for them into opportunities that would otherwise take five or ten years for them to develop on their own. Now let's talk about establishing credibility in your niche. So some of you have a market niche or a market sector or a specialist or a specialty practice that uh, distinguishes you from your competition. If you don't, I encourage you to start thinking about that as soon as possible. Because if you're a generalist, oh, I do general business litigation, then you're going to find that it's very difficult to set yourself apart from all the other lawyers who are also generalists. And opportunities will not seek you out as easily as they will if you have some sort of specialty uh, or, you know, niche component to your practice. So, again, it may have something to do with uh, I, I'm a business litigator, but I also have a uh, a lot of experience in the food and beverage industry. So a lot of food companies tend to seek me out for litigation matters. That's fine. Now you have that general litigation background, but you've also communicated that if anyone has a food company referral, they should probably send it to you before they send it to a generalist. Uh, so these are the kinds of distinctions I mean when I say niche, or if you have uh, if, you're, if you're a tax lawyer, that's fine, but you're also a certified tax lawyer. You have a particular certification or specialty that you've gone and gotten for yourself. That will set you apart from other lawyers who are more generalists and don't necessarily have that depth of expertise. 
So these are the kinds of things you want to be thinking about. And then once you've established the niche, you need to establish some credibility in that niche so that people are paying attention to what it is that you have to say. And there's four ways to do that. One is obviously authorship, to write articles around the niche or the industry or the specialty that you have so that people can read about your, uh, your, your expertise. Uh, there's, it's one thing for you to tell people that you have a niche in food and beverage. It's another for you to write articles about some of the trends in that industry or some of the things that you're seeing or some of the laws that are specific to that particular subset uh, of the uh, business population because, of course, then they're getting a, a demonstration. They're seeing evidence of your unique capabilities as opposed to you just telling them about it. Uh, Co-authorship is particularly useful if you're at the associate level because if you can speak to one of the busier partners who also works in that niche and uh, propose to them that you're going to write an article together and both of you will be credited as co-authors for that article, why then you are raising your uh, credibility because of your association with that more established partner. This is also true of your mentor. Again, this is why having a mentor of some sort is so valuable, whether that's external or internal. If you reach out to the CEO of some company and say, hey, I want to co-write an article with you. I'll do all the heavy lifting. I'll write most of it. But I just want you to, you know, offer a few comments and look at it and, and put your name on it. If they're comfortable with that, then fantastic. Now you have associated yourself with the CEO of a company. That sends a very strong signal to your network as to the company you keep and the kinds of relationships that you're looking to foster. Speaking, obviously speaking engagements, whether you're on a panel at a trade association or you're speaking through various uh, channels to deliver CLE, uh, excellent way to establish credibility. Uh, and if you're not someone who's very comfortable with public speaking, you may want to think about sitting on a panel rather than uh, presenting alone, uh, because oftentimes there's less demand uh, on a charismatic presence when you're on a panel with other professionals uh, who are also helping to deliver the message. That's something you can easily put together just by reaching out to other people in your network and proposing a panel to the uh, trade association in, let's say, food and beverage. Uh, most of you have marketing departments that can be very assistful with this, so uh, be thinking about that as you give them ideas uh, on how you want to shape your, your business development career. Making appearances alone at trade shows are, uh, is, is valuable, and it also communicates to that network that you have an investment in that niche or in that uh, industry. So um, I, I personally feel that attending trade shows or industry trade shows in particular uh, are one of the best ways to, to start to develop connections with prospective clients and referral sources who operate within that universe that is of interest to you. Uh, now, I can appreciate that depending on the law firm where you are, the law firm may not want to fly you out to Las Vegas uh, if you're, you know, in another country or if you're in a city that's far away from that so that you can attend the trade show. Uh, so you may have to get creative. You may have to look for a regional trade show uh, or you may have to um, uh, uh, spend some money out of your own pocket to go there. But it is an investment worthwhile because you will find that it's some of the most time efficient networking and focused networking that you can do. If you attend a trade show, you're there for two or three days, all of the key uh, industry leaders are there speaking and you have an opportunity to connect with them. Uh, many of the industry leaders will be speaking on panels or giving presentations. I would say go up to them after they speak. Don't just be one of the people that attends and files out of the room with everybody else. Be one of the people that stands in line to speak to whoever it is that gave the presentation and give them your commentary on, uh, you know, what you thought was valuable, exchange business cards. Perhaps that's one of the people that you can reach out for uh, as your external business development mentor. And then, of course, winning. Winning a matter of case is something that uh, will help to establish your credibility. Uh, nothing speaks volumes like results. And so when you um, win a matter or you're affiliated with a case that has won in court, uh, you always want to make sure that that is um, promoted out to your network. And sometimes your firm can do this on your behalf, 
But regardless, don't be shy about that. You put a lot of energy into making sure that you are part of a winning team, and when it works out in your favor, you want people to know that if they hire you, they're hiring a winner. All right, so that takes us to um, the uh, end of the first section of our presentation. I'm going to go through a couple of um, points about practice boomers and uh, a new platform that we have called Practice Pipeline, and then I'll reserve the rest of our time for uh, Q&A. But uh, Practice Boomers is a business development e-learning uh, platform. What it does is it uh, provides law firms with a curriculum of business development videos. These videos are very short. They're only about five minutes long because we know that associates uh, don't have a lot of time uh, to invest in attending workshops or webinars or what have you. So each of these videos uh, build on some of the themes that we've just gone through in this webinar and teach the associates those skills that they need so that they can be more proficient with developing relationships, networking, establishing credibility, and ultimately getting more clients and getting more work from those clients. Um, the uh, program also includes coaching, so we find that uh, lawyers really thrive in an environment where they're able to have discussion uh, with each other and with a coach or facilitator who can help them problem solve, help them identify key relationships to pursue, and help to vet some of the objections that sometimes come up in the topic of business development. We also provide performance tracking so the lawyers can see how they're doing, how they're trending when it comes to business development. This is also really helpful to the marketers and to law firm management so that they have a sense of how the program is doing. And we consistently provide a return on investment to law firms because the, uh, the lawyers that go through practice boomers, by and large, increase their books of business significantly during the nine-month um, program. It's not a one-off. It's not something like this webinar where you just attend one session and then it's over. It's a consistent program that lasts about nine months because we find that that immersion is really what's necessary in order to instill new habits uh, and develop uh, a meaningful, sustainable strategy. So happy to share more about Practice Boomers. You can also go to practiceboomers.com, and we have a, uh, a video that, that walks through that program. And we also have something called Practice Pipeline. This is a new program. It's uh, pipeline management for lawyers. What that means is that, remember when I talked about those 20 key relationships and some sort of CRM that will help you keep track of them? Uh, well, Pipeline is one of the things that you could use for that. Well, we have a very high adoption rate with lawyers, which is unique because most CRM lawyers don't really want to use. It's overcomplicated. It just feels like busy work. Um, but because of the way Pipeline is designed, we have a 70% adoption rate from lawyers. The lawyers actually like to use it, and they do use it. And it also includes a coaching component so that there's discussion and problem solving and accountability and ultimately uh, results for the lawyers who, uh, who are on the platform. So i um, happy to share more about that as well if you contact me directly. Let's uh, move into the last section here. So uh, again, as I said, our agenda today would uh, cover uh, reasoning for getting a head start in business development, identifying some of your leverage points. We gave you some networking strategies. We talked through mentors, external and internal. And we also talked about how to establish credibility in a particular market or practice niche. So we'll move into the Q&A section. So I hope you have uh, taken what I said earlier to heart and, and jotted down a question or two. We've left about 15 minutes uh, for Q&A. And uh, I will uh, now turn the floor over to you, Lindsay, so that you can navigate any questions that are coming in and uh, to uh, send them my way so that I can respond to them. Hi, David. Great. Thanks so much. Um, we haven't had any questions yet, so I'd like to invite anybody that would like to ask a question to put it in the chat box. That should be available on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, we can also take questions afterwards if you have them, and I'll be sending David's information around uh, so you can reach out to him directly as well. I'll give them just a minute to type any in. We have a lot of people on the call, so it would be great if, uh, if you're curious about something to share that with the group so that uh, in, in case anybody else is thinking the exact same thing, that would be great. And I know that sometimes uh, the way that um, law firms engage in this kind of uh, programming is that they'll have several associates or several partners, or however they have decided to uh, deliver it, 
in a, in a conference room, and it can just be difficult and awkward to facilitate questions from a large group like that. So if that's the case, again, you know, whether it's a, an, a coordinator or a marketer or an administrator or somebody who has put this uh, program together for their firm, thank you for doing so, and feel free to reach out to me separately if there's a, a question that you think uh, would be relevant to this discussion and, and you'd like some feedback on it. I'm happy to, happy to share that. Great. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Um, I'm not seeing anything come in, and I think you're exactly right, David. It's, it's difficult with this, uh, this type of format. Um, so we will make sure to share David's contact information, and he'll, all be, he'll also be reaching out to those of you who registered uh, directly for the session to, uh, to follow up. So with that, I would like to say thank you again to David, uh, President of the Ackard Advisory, for a wonderful program. I think that was some great information, and uh, we got a lot out of it. And uh, that's, as we said before, is an International Lawyers Network webinar presentation. We'll be sharing the recording for this, so you can watch it again if you would like or share it with your colleagues. And, uh, and we look forward to following up with each of you. Thanks again, David. Thanks, Lindsay. Happy to do it.